Dari your turn. Unmute. Uh, okay, Tuan uh, you may unmute uh, because you are the host. Go. Let me start, okay? Yang berbahagia Tan Sri Tan Sri, Datuk Datuk, ladies and gentlemen, and a very good morning to all of you. My name is Dolly Cho, and I'm the master of ceremony for today's talk. I'm a committee member of BGAM and holding the chair leadership for social and networking subcommittee. Today's talk is by Tan Sri Mohammad Arif bin Mohammad Yusuf. I, heard, I first heard of this young Mohamed Arif was way back some three and a half decades ago from Mr. Joseph Tan. What I'm about to tell you is something maybe Google don't tell you. Mr. Joseph Tan had lots of praises of you. And at this juncture, he told us that he was emigrating. Inche Arif then was his sterling reserve. And together with Mr. Lo Siu Chiang, had been handpicked by handpicked for the succession plan for the firm of Joseph Tan and Tang Kuala Lumpur. For some good reasons, it was rebranded as Chiang and Ari, and that was to remain as the name of the legal practice for today. Some over 30 years forward, I hear again the name of Tan Sri Muhammad Ari, and this time around, as the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Parliament of Malaysia. He became the beacon of hope for us as netizens to have a better tamed parliament, a better constitu constitution, a better Malaysia for the Malaysians. Unfortunately, it was short lived and it turned parliament on its back, which will form the topic of our talk for today. Now, this is one of the series of our Lift to, in, like, Lift to Inspire series promulgated by our chairman, Dato Kamaruddin bin Muhammad Ali. These talks have been going on for the first, for the last few months, and the first of which was a talk by Tun Han Omar, our former Inspector General of Police, who happened to be their BGAM's past president. He spoke much about the days as IGP of a young Malaysian. He was followed by the talk, some lunch hosted, hosted by Tunku Razali Hamza at his residence. Tan Sri Nazir Raza was our third speaker, while the fourth speaker was Dr. John Chan of CVS Hospital with a talk entitled Evolution of Heart Disease Treatment in the 21st Century. Miss Joanne Yo stole the limelight music to your ears. And today we present to you Parliament Unexpected by Tan Sri Aru. May I, not, may I now call upon our president, Dato Kamaruddin Ali, the president of BGAM on board to present his welcoming speech and his introduction of Tan Sri Ari to our audience. Okay, thank you very much, Dolly. Thank you, that's Very nice introduction. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. Tan Sri Tan Sri, Datuk Sri Datuk Sri, Datuk Datuk, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to our British Graduate Association Malaysia talk show in our Leap to Inspire series. As already mentioned by Dolly, this time our honorable guest is Tan Sri Mama Ari bin Mau Yusof, a former speaker of Dewan Rakyat from 1918 to 2020. A highly qualified lawyer getting his bachelor and master's degree in law from London School of Economics, LSE. He was then called to bar law at uh, Lincoln's Inn. Tansri Arif have obviously read and seen enough of what has happened in the past immediately after he vacated the speaker's seat. As a politician himself, Tan Sri is very much concerned about what is going on in Malaysia, although he has gone back, uh, although he has gone back to his uh, previous career, now he has gone back to his previous career as a legal consultant. Majority of us has problem on trust deficit, which on the extreme side, make us feel 
that politicians cannot be trusted to run a nation. Well, there's a perception. Most of them are perceived without uh, any vision how to run a country, although they are sitting on the government corridor of power. Tansri is also in the thick of some of the things that are now happening in our country. His concern for Malaysia's future. As a Malaysian, he believes that we don't deserve with what is happening now. Is the law on frogging going to happen? The government said it will neutralize in July. What happened if the GE is in July? It just happened, Tansri political party Amana is one of the signatory to the MOU. How bad does it have to be before we have enough political will and courage to straighten our path? Parliament unexpected is written by Tansri Arif. The present speaker, Tansri Azharun, was his student at UC Malaya. And coincidentally, both were from the same Ibrahim Secondary School in Sukhan Petani, Kedah. At the university, Datuk Sri Takyudin and Datuk Sri Azmina were Tansri students. It is really a parliament unexpected. Anyway, about the book, our moderator will dwell further on it with Tansri shortly. On behalf of British Graduate Association Malaysia, let me take this opportunity to thank Tansri Arif. I'm very sure we can learn and take inspiration from your appearance and discussion today, no matter where our stations are. Also, our moderator today is Stephen Fung, a former Oxford student, a lawyer by profession. And about three decades ago, he was our deputy president of British Graduate Association Malaysia. Thank you very much, Stephen, for agreeing to be the moderator and hope you can make this event more exciting. Thank you, Dolly. Our forever energetic and enthusiastic uh, MC of the event. She is also one of our ESCO member. So ladies and gentlemen, let us enjoy the show. Thank you, Dato. Like all houses of justice, we have a lawyer to spar another. It was our president's idea that we needed a lawyer of some equal standing as a moderator to face another famous lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and this will bring our talk to greater heights. May I now welcome Mr. Stephen Frank E. Dane. A Thank young you. man of 59. Can I introduce you, Mr. Stephen Frank? Thank Mr. you. 59, by training a lawyer, graduate, graduated from the University of Oxford, with a Master's of Arts subsequently in jurisprudence in 1991. He was called to the Bar of England and Wales at Lincoln's Inn in 1987, the High Court of Malaya in 1988, and the Supreme Court of Singapore in 1982. He's the Managing Director of the Legal Practice of Kamaruddin and Partners, and has lots of other credentials, which I think uh, <laughs> does not need to be mentioned at this current moment. He was formerly the BGAM Deputy President and was co-opted back to the current, the current BGAM Executive Committee and a member of the Malaysian Crime Prevention Foundation. May I now pass the baton to you, Mr. Stephen Fung, to commence with the talk and the introduction of our speaker for the day to yeah. our, to the audience. Country, I'm sorry, to the audience. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dolly. Yeah, and good, good morning, everyone. Yeah. So yeah, look, they, they asked me, Tansri, they asked me to spar with you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you just oh, don't floor me. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we we as we were talking to Tansri, I we realized that uh, we were in one case together, actually. Um I was our team, okay, basically it's a, a, a team of lawyers. My team was acting for Lim Teng Ye, oh. the, the, the late Tun Lim Teng Ye, president of Gerakan, and Tan Sri Arif was then acting for uh, Joseph, Joseph Chong. Yes, the big fight. Oh, yes. 
<laughs> yeah. So so we somehow yeah we 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 are now on the the same platform, but more <laughs> diplomatic. <laughs> okay, that's I mean, we, you can see there are a lot of. You know your your book. The title of your book is incredible because many things are un unexpected. You know who would expect that we have three prime ministers in such a short time, and who would expect even uh, the a, a prime minister from Abnum who was voted out in GE14 to even come back? Yeah, many. I, I think the to some extent. The title unexpected extends more than parliament. Okay. Um, so now I we will I, I receive a lot of questions ask you, so but that will <laughs> I, I will <laughs> I, I will ask you afterwards. <laughs> uh, but maybe you would like to get you know get out of your chest. What what it is parliament unexpected or even any other topics that are related? Okay, so now um I so please, Tansri, your turn. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you, Tivian. Now, first of all, I'll have to do the customary things, um, yeah. like thanking the organizers of VGM for inviting me to, to participate in the Zoom forum. I wish, you know, COVID was over and done with, then we can physically meet. Um, but Zoom is just as good. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Rolly, for, for those very kind words and uh, a throwback to my days in uh, Joseph Tan and Tang. Sadly, uh, Joseph Tan passed away, I think, a few uh, years ago. Yeah, he was my first partner, so to say. And the firm subsequently um, became Chang and Arif, and now, of course, uh, it's expanded to the merger with Chui and Company. So now it's Chui and Company Plus. Chiang and Arif, or in short, CCA is a mouthful, but so we shortened it to CCA. Uh, used to be CNA, so it used to be the butt of many jokes, you know, CNA, the department store in London, if you, if you know. Uh, <laughs> now, um, and thank you, Dr. Kamar, Kamar for, for inviting me as president of BIGAM, and of course, Mr. Chow, uh, both of whom have got a splendid background. Again, you know, brings me back to my days in London. Actually, I spent about eight years in London, you know, in total. Oh, oh, wow. It's a long time, eh? uh, took away my youth. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, it, was, it was great. Those times were great. Late 60s, uh, early 70s, and uh, ending with the 80s. Uh, tumultuous times. Anyway, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm very pleased to be here basically to share some of my thoughts. Uh, Stephen uh, has given me a long list of questions. Uh, I hope he will not ask all of them because I, <laughs> some of them I cannot answer. <laughs> um, but, but let me fill you in on the background to the book Parliament Unexpected. Um, my co-author, Lutfi Hakim, and I, um, took a long time, you know, in deciding what should be the proper title of the book. One title which came to my mind was um, "Points of Disorder." Uh, it sound, sounded good, but not that good. And of course, the other one was "Disorder in the House." Again, you know, shades of uh, disorder and anarchy and uh, nasty things. Um, uh, so we said, we said why, why, why don't we choose Parliament Unexpected, kind of a neutral topic, and I think it camps, encapsulates the content of the book, now, which is a book that I have written upon the promptings of friends to document um, the critical period in my mind of our parliamentary history. I hope it's not going to be repeated again, uh, but I had to document that period um, for historical record, perhaps, and also for, to defend myself in a way, because uh, I got criticized, I got praised on, on the number of decisions that I took. Um, 
but um, since I was privy to many of the events, I thought I might as well document them so that later on, those who are interested, whether as a rich researcher or as a you know, casual interested reader, the book will be available for everyone to read. It is actually also written with the Malaysian student in mind. I, I feel that there have been too many cases on law, it's different perhaps to uh, agree with me. Uh, many books on law, important aspects of the law, which very few, very few people read, except for lawyers. You know? So I thought, why don't I write this book which uh, is aimed at a more general audience um, so that people will know what happened in parliament. What are the procedures uh, that constantly, constantly recur in parliament and what are they about in simple terms uh, with the hope that people will begin to understand our institution and appreciate how important uh, this particular institution is. But the book doesn't, does not end there. I think the most important part of uh, the book is actually the closing chapter, in closing. Again, there was a lot of discussion on this. Um, we thought we'll have a prologue and an epilogue. And then my editor said, why epilogue? The story is not yet done. <laughs> it's not finished. And I said, yeah, that, that's a valid point. So we thought about it. And you'll notice the last chapter is not an epilogue but it is in closing, in closing of a discussion that is ongoing. And um, I think it is an important part of the book and I hope people will read it, uh, look at the items or the uh, you know, features that uh, I have attempted to highlight um, and the problems and promises of uh, Malaysia should be there. Um, it, would, it is not done in great detail, of course, uh, but the main aspects of our melody, uh, I hope I have highlighted in, in, in the closing chapter. Again, it is better to relate whatever I have to say in the closing chapter to the episodes that I have um, written on uh, in the main chapters of the book. If you talk about you know, communalism or racism, that I have devoted an entire chapter to this problem. In a sad episode in, in my tenure as a speaker, but I felt I had to take it up and document it so that people will read and will appreciate and perhaps feel a little bit sad or disgusted at the things that happened um, in parliament. But all said, I have not written something that, that um, throw our parliament to the gutters. No, no. I have written the book again with hope. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly a pessimist, you know, but there is a tinge of pessimism in every one of us, I think, in the current, current stage. But I think we need to look forward for, for the future with hope, with um, optimism, because I have stated it in the book, we deserve better. I think uh, uh, Tokama mentioned it even earlier. We deserve better as a country, as citizens of this country, we deserve better and we can do better. I mean, look at you know, the people who are gathered here. Uh, how many do we have here? About 300? Yeah. Uh, uh, people gathered here, I mean, all highly qualified and I suppose raring to go to assist this country to achieve greater heights. Um, I think that's an important point to underscore even now, not only in 2018, but now. We, we can see in 2018, I mentioned in a number of uh, speeches that I made, including one in London at the Commonwealth Institute, uh, I stressed that many of our friends were looking at Malaysia as a beacon of hope for the region. I think now, looking at what's just happening, what's happening in the region, uh, particularly in countries like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Myanmar, and heaven knows what else uh, hereafter, we, despite the instability in this country, um, we are not yet a basket case, and hopefully will not be a basket case. You know, but we uh, we still have that potential to show the way. Um, and to, to do that, 
we need to seriously think about institutional reforms and political reforms and economic reforms. I mean, all three must go together. You, you know, uh, it's no, no good to simply speak of institutional reform. That's easy. Pass the anti-hopping law. <laughs> That's institutional reform. But that will only cure part of the problem. So I think we have to look at it holistically. And of course, the book does not address it because I'm not qualified. I cannot talk about economic reform. And there are many others in the room, many others outside this room who will be able to contribute on proper economic reform. Um, so basically, that, that, that's why the book was written. And uh, it is not a memoir. I did a video you know, before the book was launched. I, I told the, pub, uh, the Malaysian public, this is not a memoir. Uh, it is not a book written by me for me you know to, to narrate my life history although i've included some photographs uh, some <laughs> photographs in color that you know, um, because as you know was said by alice in alice in wonderland what is a book without pictures eh? so you must have <laughs> pictures in a book uh, so that documents um that if you want a memoir i suppose that's a pictorial memoir of sorts ending with you know my removal in parliament and i have included one photograph which was not in the slide just now and uh, the gathering of uh, opposition mps in my room after i was voted out uh, quite a sad picture but uh, but if you look carefully i, was, I wasn't that sad you know? um, <laughs> it was a job done i had contributed my bit and i hope whoever takes over current speaker speaker <laughs> after him will continue you know the the reforms that we wanted to do i did not create those reforms i went in to continue the reforms and then a few more reforms which were fundamental but it's it's not rocket science but these are things which uh, anyone can think of um i took many of the uh, reforms from the, the publication um, of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, uh, benchmarks for Commonwealth legislatures. So we, we must attain those benchmarks. Um, so well, that's it. Uh, of course, Stephen and I come from the same inn, Lincoln's Inn. Uh, <laughs> yes. Where they serve horrible curry, sweet curry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was the only place we could get curry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and we get the. Uh, Lingam's chili sauce. Lingam chili sauce. <laughs> <that's right. laughs> well, today. Yeah. So, Tansri, I, I think what you say is is right, and and I, I believe that even the the reform that you are talking, I there is that hope because I believe it is is still continuing. Okay. It is still continued. In particular, in, I, I know we mentioned about the proposed anti-hopping law. Okay, uh, I, you could see there are many dynamics going on. Uh, I, I know when we talk about politicians hopping, uh, that there is something sad that I'm not the Malaysian use the word kata or frogs. Some say good kata or bad frogs. So on and so forth. Um, I know that is that dynamic. If you if they jump to my side, oh, they are good. <laughs> if you jump to the other side, they are bad. But uh, you know, sometimes there's no objectivity. Okay, and uh, Azalina Osman talks about having a recall vote in that process. Okay, and we I, I'm given to understand that she is also your student. Is that correct? That's right. So you 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 have many students, but I think you're on the other side now. <laughs> <laughs> and what has happened with one to ninety is that to follow very much is which is a subject matter in your heart, which is the parliamentary select committee, right? And he has thrown this law to the committee. Okay, can you give us the you know for me? There is a hope when a parliamentary select committee is choose, because it means that both MPs from the oppositions and the government, 
They are sitting down and looking through the, you know, the, the fine words, yeah? the fine words, the, the detail, people talk about the detail, is, is the devil is in the detail, and now they are going through one by one. Okay, can you comment on this, this entire dynamic? Um, uh, as I was listening to, to you, I was also looking at the comments. You know, yeah, very very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, it has a bit to to, to do with um, what I'm going to say now. That there, there is no uh, over emphasizing you know, the importance of uh, parliamentary select committees. It is uh, proven to be very effective in UK, as well as New Zealand and Australia. And even in our region, you know, there are countries in ASEAN who have fairly long history of select committees, many of them, uh, including the, the, the Philippines and Vietnam. It was surprised. Vietnam has had select committees much longer than, than we have. They're just beginning, except for the Public Accounts Committee. Yeah, uh, correct. Which we, have had. we only have one, the Public Accounts. Uh, the, public rest accounts committee. Is... the rest were far, a few were ad hoc. They did the job, pulled it up, you know, but we want a standing committee sort of system. And uh, of course, it is good to see things moving. But I'm also dismayed that how things are being done. I don't think they appreciate fully uh, how select committees should be organized. Um, you take the latest move to refer the bill, yeah. uh, the amendment bill to the select committee. Mm -hmm. uh, special select committee, but I, I recoil in horror because it's reported, unless I'm wrong, the minister is going to be the chairman of this committee. That's wrong. A parliamentary select committee must be independent. If you cannot appreciate this, then you've got it all wrong. You know, the committee can meet, deliberate among themselves, call in whatever experts that they want, and formulate, like you say, is even you know, the, the nitty gritty of, of the yeah. law, the yeah. commas, the full stop, yeah. the yes. whatever. You, know, you, you look at it, you draft it properly, and then produce a report, send it to the minister. After all, he's the minister, right? But you should also have a debate in, on the floor of the house. Yes. That's how things are done. You know, uh, report to parliament, have a debate on that at second reading. Minister is kept informed. He replies, mm. and then you you pass, yeah, uh, the, the the bill at, at second reading, you know, and, and that, that's done. The beauty of special select committee is, if you do it properly, it will consist of members who have the expertise, will have the vision, will have the correct temperament, and who will do their work in the national interest. That's why committees are, are, are good and very valuable to have. As they say quite routinely in UK, in select committees, you leave your politics at the door. Yeah. Once you enter, and then you, you discuss and formulate as you would do in a business-like setting. I mean, it's proven to be, I mean, you economics are here, you, you, you know, all, you know, management experts. The best way is to conduct meetings along the lines of a board or you know, committee management meeting you actually get actual decisions but not on the floor of the house Correct. the floor of the house is mainly for show you know let's face it some work gets done because of checks and balances uh, ministers uh, you know criticize whatever hopefully once criticized they go back to the ministries and they will improve on the policies whatever um, but not much will be done Sometimes because we shouted at each other. Yeah, yes. yes. <laughs> you know, we did a study on, on this. Actually, one of the um, uh, think tanks did the study. We found out that um, about five days of parliamentary time uh, were wasted on politicking. Is there for anyone to read? It's done by RI, uh, IRDP, eh? Institute yeah. for Research and Development of Policy. You know, they actually look at and said, and analyze quantitatively the time misspent on invectives, on points of order, you know, things like that. Um, so, so, so there you are. This is something which needs to be done. And I hope they will do it properly. 
make sure you choose qualified chairman of these committees. If people are not qualified, why do you want to appoint them as chairman of committees? So just because they come from a certain political party, they have to be made chairman of a committee. You, know, you should choose the most qualified across parties, bipartisan. You know, if someone from the opposition is good in a particular area, make him the chairman. What, what's wrong with it? It's not as if you don't have a president. We are already doing it now uh, at the level of the PAC. You know, we yeah. were quite advanced, even by Conwell standards, when we said, okay, mm -hmm. the chairman of the PAC will be from the opposition. Uh, but deputy chairman will be from the government. So you it's like a balance. You know? um, I must say, during Pakatan Harapan, uh, Harapan's administration, these fundamental issues were well understood. It took some time mm. uh, to get things moving, you know, but the yeah. basic principles were well understood. I had little problems in convincing mm. that many of them that uh, this is how things should be done. Uh, that's why I'm, it was very you know, easy for me to set up the initial six special right. select committees because they knew yeah. Yeah. it had to be done yeah. i yeah. mean talk about preferring bills to to a select committee we establish one full committee to do that you know yeah <laughs> um bills committee we call it mm. to consider bills in parliament uh, of uh, great importance uh, as and when they come in parliament they refer to this particular committee consideration of bills special select committee that's what we call it uh, yeah. but when Rikata national came in after the yeah, charit move uh, tango or whatever yeah um they did away with it so now bills will be referred to something ad hoc mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. that's three uh, you mentioned about the quality of the people on the committee, okay? And that's why it's during our talk with Tan Sri Nazir Razak. Of course, this is just talk and it's, it's further away from our constitution is the idea of an elected prime minister. You know, the, the whole, it, it all came about because we know that with a very loose, Coalition. It doesn't matter from which side the prime minister is going to come from. As long as you upset a group of five or more, that's all. And the whole government could collapse. Okay, It can happen to both sides. That's why people say, maybe we should have an elected prime minister. Um, what, what do you think? You know, because then the elected prime minister can select the best. Okay, now is, is that's how it relates to. Okay, I have to select the best uh, in order to make sure that you know we we get the best of the country uh, to participate. Yeah, that's me, please. Yes, yes. Um, we can have that system if we abandon this current system, and it's not quite the Westminster style of government. Um, it is an idea I think we should think about. Mm. There are pros and cons to it. Indonesia has that system, mm. you know, but um, the president uh, doesn't sit in the uh, legislative assembly. Mm. You know, so there is no direct control. And of course, the president of Indonesia is free to choose his yes. cabinet colleagues Yes. Uh, from from all across, uh, it's not limited to just members of the legislature. Yeah. Mm. So there are benefits. In fact, some countries in the common, Commonwealth have opted for it. Uh, Kenya, for instance, um, mm. have modified their Westminster system to something like a um, presidential system, quasi-presidential system. Uh, I think Sri Lanka has modified it also. But look at what is happening in Sri Lanka. <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sadly, sadly, you know, I was in Sri Lanka about a bit more than three years back, and the country was booming. Yeah? And that shows how things can turn so rapidly. Yeah? Um, that's why we also have to be very careful and learn from the mistakes of, of others yeah? and stem the tide before it engulfs us. Yeah? 
um, yeah, back to that issue of parliament, uh, prime minister to be elected. But I think it is a bit too premature to think at this point. Mm. Okay. There will still be that element of politicking. You know, yeah. we have this entire generation uh, who are breeding another generation mm. to think in terms of the current system. You know, the grassroots politicking that has been set so deep. That's where they get their influence from. So you change to direct election. Um, I don't know what, what form it will take. Yeah. Um, but whatever, this is something to think about. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing, you know, they talk about Dazir Raza, I mean, uh, he and his particular group are also thinking of, uh, you know, people's assembly sort of uh, idea. Yes, huh? yeah. Correct. Which is good. I think I fully support this idea of people's assembly to have another level of, of checking mechanism on parliament. You know, it's like monopolies and antitrust. <laughs> you, you <laughs> want to have a monopoly, in this case, monopoly over legislation, there's little control and people misbehave. But if you have shared yeah, monopoly, then we have mm -hmm. another overarching body who um, is properly constituted under the constitution, then you, you see a balancing yes. of, of parliament and uh, you know the interests of the citizens. Um, I I would think as between the elected uh, premier and this people's assembly, I will put my money in the people's assembly. Yeah. As a good improvement to, to the system. Yeah. Okay. But we should seriously think, seriously think about it. I've been informed in the island has a good model that we can mm. look at. Oh, yeah. So we should be looking yeah, at we it. should, huh? yeah. Because for most of us who look from the outside, i.e., outside the parliament, we we also, you know, I'm quite sure you are aware that some people say, "Oh, parliament is just a rubber stamp of the current government." It is true, right? During particularly during the days when the the government controlled two thirds of parliament, you know. So I think it's good to have some even check and balances of that dynamics. Yeah, you you agree with that? Sorry, I mean, I miss, uh, particularly the, the point top. that Parliament is just a rubber stamp for the government. Well, it, it used to be. Oh. I, mean, I, I I mentioned this in uh, a few parts in the book. Yeah, how, how it uh, correct tended into this. And you know, being a yeah. rubber stamp and uh, eventually yeah. losing the trust of, of the Raya. Yes. It's no longer a beacon of trust or repository of yeah. trust. No, particularly uh, for us, yeah. from the constitutional law point, we remember the three arms of the government, right? Mm. The judiciary, the legislature, and the executive. But from the Malaysian point of view, hey, the, 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 legis uh, the executive has already taken over <laughs> the parliament. And some even say, the judiciary as well. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. This is a weakness of the parliamentary system, the Westminster parliamentary system. Uh, even in UK, it works this way too. You know, mm -hmm. the over concentration of power in the executive, but um, it ebbs and flows. At the moment, uh, because of the uh, politics, uh, of course, the executive is not as powerful as before. Yeah. Yeah, then, then then it becomes a function of politics. Um, but all said, uh, I, I would tend to agree this is a weakness in the current system, uh, the over centralization of power in the executive. This is why we need to have people of honesty, of integrity, of competence to be our leaders. But if we don't, who are we to blame? They can grumble and kind of whatnot, but we choose our leaders. Yeah. <laughs> so, what is the answer to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer. <laughs> it's up to us. I mean, when people say, "Ah, uh, we don't like our leaders," so I'm not going to vote this time. It makes no difference. I don't think there's an argument. Yeah, yeah. That's not an so, argument. It's we must go out fully and vote for whoever that we think and they can cure the ills of, of, of this country. Yeah. 
and uh, there you are. Yeah, talking about that, curing the ills of our country, you know, people, people, we we always mention about the MACC, the Malaysia Anti-Corruption uh, Commission. I mean, we have talked about it many times. Should it be put under the parliament? Or should there be ombudsman for checks and balances? And what's the difference if we put the MACC under parliament? Or an independent MACC under our ago? There is a big difference because the position of the ago is well understood. And the Agung is a constitutional monarch. Yeah. Uh, the Agung doesn't, you know, in pick and choose uh, uh, whoever is to head a, a particular agency. It's done in his name. Maybe some influence will be there. But it is not as good as parliament having a say, ah. uh, which uh, was what we were working on. You, know? um, you will also remember, perhaps, there was the other special select committee called Special Select Committee on Major Public Appointments. Mm. And the major public appointments included the chairman of the MBCC. Yep. You know? So it was in the works that parliament must have some control over yes. the choice of the members of MACC. Mm. And MACC should eventually be fully accountable to Parliament. It was already agreed. You know, MACC, yeah. uh, Judicial Appointments Commission, you know, yeah. STRM yes. should come under parliamentary purview. Mm. And to add further force to, to this idea of enhancing checks and balances in the system, there was a move to have a full-fledged ombudsman. Yes. And we went through a lot of discussions on this, you know, uh, in parliament as well as outside parliament. And it, this, one of the suggestions of the ombudsman must be housed in parliament. Ah. I was the one who said, no, don't do that. You know, uh, we want the ombudsman to also be independent. Ah. You know, if you say yeah, he has to be independent, yeah. then there, there is a flaw in that argument. You know, he can report to parliament, yeah. and parliament can perhaps choose who the ombudsman is. But he must be free to do his job. The parliament cannot be expected to be wholly perfect. The ombudsman will be there to make sure that even parliament will do its job you know, properly within the constitution. But everything came to uh, nothing because of uh, the Sheraton move. Mm. You see, yeah. Uh, uh, would you say that? Mm. Would you say that it? That, you know, if if PH had a little bit more time, mm. more call it, you know, to borrow the words from construction, more more foundation could have mm. been all in. Mm. Yeah, if only we were just doing the piling, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe the land clearance and the soil <laughs> test. <laughs> we wanted to build the superstructure. Yeah, you know, but they're not on the piling. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, that, that's a very apt comparison. If given a bit more time, this I can tell you, I mean, perhaps I am biased, they could call it what you like. You know? But I was there in the seat and I was looking at the goings on and, and, and hearing all these comments even outside the, the, the day one. Yeah? Uh, the opposition were all out to drag down the government. It was not as if Pakatan did not fulfill its promises. Let's let's be fair. Look at the record over two years. What Pakatan yeah. Harapan has done. Yeah. You, you know, do do a proper ticking of, of uh, you know the columns. Yeah. Uh, you cannot say that uh, we, there were empty promises, or you know to use the uh, vernacular words they were using, anching, kenching, whatever everyone was kenching. around. that's us. Quite clearly, an attempt to drag down the government. Hmm. Now, I, I heard it said directly. Ah, ini kerajaan satu penggal. It was said by them. Hmm. So right from the start, it, it, this was a case of let's bring this government down. 
because of this feeling that uh, no, it's not Melayu enough, <laughs> to, to <laughs> Islamic enough. So you are back to this raw narrative. I think it has to be said. I mean, with a forum like this, and everyone is mature enough, you know, we can. I think I ought to say it, yeah, and tell it as as it is. But that was what happened. That is why, if you tie the the the, 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 the dots together, you can see a sequence, you know, a clear sequence. I said, the room. Yeah, I, I, I said yes. Uh, can you talk about that? Uh, I said, yeah, yeah, sure. I think it was a missed opportunity. Uh, again, I devoted one entire chapter to it, Correct. plus uh, mm. copious uh, quotation from the Hansard. You can see how toxic it was. But why should it be toxic? You know, it's true when you and I are lawyers, right? Now, the most, <laughs> I did international law. I think you must have done international law. And so many uh, yes, public uh, international others law. in the room have done international law. You, you know what I said is, you know, I said it's not something which is going to destroy the Bumiputra rights. There are exceptions to it. Yeah. It is a treaty that everyone else, except for a few who have uh, acceded to it. You, you know. So yeah. why was the narrative in Malaysia made so different? Yeah, to the extent that someone can call the then you know, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, well, so can we know you, you are liberal, you know, sell your race uh, down the whatever. You know. This is toxic uh, attitude, toxic discussion in our August House. You know, an important institution like the parliament is brought down to this, this really nasty level mm. over a matter we should have got unanimous support. <laughs> yeah. No, Malaysia. We, we have to get rid of uh, this extreme element. Again, in the I, closing I, chapter, I, I spoke of expanding the middle ground. You know, uh, it's not going to be easy. I said the middle ground is like jelly um, because of the situation in Malaysia. Uh, even those liberals, uh, which we can gather, tend to verge from one position to the other, you know, depending on the issues. You can see it even now. Uh, it seems similar uh, ah. to the king. Uh, yeah. That is a graphic illustration of our, but about what I was trying to say in the closing chapter. We are not expanding the middle ground when there are racial overtones to okay. something that can be handled legally, you know. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's unfair, let's keep race out of it. Yeah. Let's talk about fairness. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about right. you know us as Malaysians. Yeah. You know, that's the bad thing. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's look at the good. <laughs> you know, let's look at the good. I'm so happy that I find um, Machis and uh, you, you know Kaka and Ades, you know, ganging up and really supporting uh, and. Uh, Jettison, jettisoning this racial argument. And they speak as Malaysians, not so much as Malay or, or, or Chinese or, or Indian or, or the rest. Yeah, that, That's how things should move. That yeah. is expanding the middle ground. You see, don't don't, some, don't you know, yeah. give in to temptation that everything eventually has to be couched in racial terms. Okay. Um, Since you talk about this, you see, you, you know I'm from Kelantan, you're from Kedah. Mm. Uh, so we have some Thai connection somewhere. Mm. But in Kelantan, generally speaking, after the third generation, all of us are legally defined, okay, under the Kelantan state enactment as anak Kelantan after mm. the third generation. So I'm going to talk because at the federal level in KL, we talk in terms of Bumi Putra and non Bumi Putra. Will there be a cut off point where um, I know at the beginning we, we mentioned about the case, our case against uh, between Joseph Chong and Lin Keng Yek? Because Lin Keng Yek mentioned, he said, Are you trying to say that even after our five generations, six generations, ten generations, uh, some of us are still called as? Non-Bumiputra, 
Will there be a cut-off point? Should we talk about it? Should we debate about it? You know, in Kelantan, you know, after third generation, you actually legally define anak Kelantan. Actually, the other side is orang luar. Okay, they are not from Kelantan. So, mm. a, a, any comment? Because it, it relates to insert, it relates to, you know, maybe some of the more deep-seated fear that the Malays have. You know, but you can see it, if, if at all it happened in Kelantan, you know, <laughs> the Malay heartland. Mm. Mm. Uh, well, in Kedah too, you know, the uh, oh, Kedah. Oh. Siamese, uh, Bumi Putra. <laughs> uh, it's uh, funny, one of my friends, uh, school friend, primary school friend, uh, pull out a card and say, guess I'm a member of which party? This is a guy I took to be a Chinese. Eh? Guess I'm a member <laughs> of which party? I think you are DAP. He said, no, Gerakan, no. I said, what? He said, Bersatu. <laughs> Why? Because it's actually uh, Siam, Sam Sam. Eh? Oh. Uh, so, I said, who you? Uh, anyway, in, in, in Kedah, um, Siamese, Bumi uh, Putras, uh, have uh, same rights as Malays to own land and so on and so forth. Eh? Yes. Um, but these are perhaps pointers for, 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 for the future. Mm. But it is something, I think I spoke to you earlier on this, that has to be done in stages. Yeah. There are shortcomings Correct. in the system. Yeah. Because I, I, the way I see it, we're not merely looking at uh, the Malays, the Bumiputras. So we're also looking at the non Bumiputras as well, mm. or yes. on how to maintain this adjustment of course, logically and in terms of fairness, we have to arrive at that destination. Yeah. But, but before we do so, we must not really rock the boat too much so yeah. that it becomes counterproductive, which Correct. is a danger in Malaysia. You know, at any one time, a yeah, simple yeah. episode yeah. can be so manipulated, yeah. especially like now insert. with social like media, <laughs> yeah, that it becomes toxic, I mean, that doesn't achieve the purpose. But mm -hmm. I agree with you. Very slowly, you know, perhaps as fast as we as we can. Um, we should not be thinking of ourselves as you know, Malays, uh, Indians, or Chinese, or you know, East Malaysian. Uh, but yeah. as as Malaysians, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, I I don't see the difference. I I I I am a Malaysian. I don't go out purposely to tell people I'm a Malay, for instance. You know. Right. Yeah, so it's it's the beginning. It's beginning. And my children too. They say, I'm a Bumi Putra. No, you don't project the image of yourself being a Bumi Putra. You are a Malaysian, and you are yeah. proud to be a Malaysian. Yes. No? Uh, and likewise, uh, I think many of my Chinese friends, particularly the younger ones, um, adopt this kind of uh, approach to to society. Yeah. But they, they still exist. This is why I have to be careful here. Yeah. They still exist amongst the most senior members of our citizenry you know, who are not quite yet out of this mold. You know. They still think of themselves as police, Indians, Chinese. And uh, sadly, sometimes influences in other countries have a bearing on the attitudes they take. Mm -hmm. Let's face it. Yeah? Um, but looking forward, and I'm very hopeful that the young will not be thinking in terms of Malays, Chinese, Indians, and, but as Malaysians. You know, just to give you some insight on, on what um, we were facing, just maybe 30 years back, I was one of the founder members of uh, Parti Nationalist Malaysia, 30 years or 40 years back. Wow. We wanted to set up a fully multiracial political organization oh. yeah, based mostly on the moderate element in society mm -hmm. and the trade union movement. We had some success, some initial success. There are many trade unionists were in favor. Right? But then again, the, I think the conditions were not right because there was still a lot of bickering um, within the party, back to this 
you know, question of race, Bumi Putra, non Bumi Putra, blah, 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 you know. So it didn't quite succeed. It was an early attempt. Later, when um, PKR was formed, yeah, um, I was having some, personally, having some second thoughts. Like, can this party succeed? Judging from the experience that we had in uh, Party Nationalist um, Malaysia. Yeah. But th there you go. You, you have an actual model today, despite its internal problems, which are not racist in nature. No? It has stood the test of time. It is a fully uh, multiracial organization with a fully multiracial membership. And the leadership reflects this multiracial element as well. So we are progressing bit by bit. So you know, not everything is gloom and doom and uh, uh, only racist in Malaysia. There are promising signs, including now MUDA, that's multiracial. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think the mindset probably is evolving into something better. Mm -hmm. But let's not stoke the fire of, of uh, communalism again. <laughs> yeah. Everything is turned yeah. to communalism. And, uh, yeah. One uh, step forward, then two step backward. If yeah, yeah, yeah. that one is not careful. Mm -hmm. And at, at, at the end of the day, ultimately, it's a question of economics, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah, with economic development, and everyone has a good share of the pie, I mean, there'll be no grumblings about uh, Bumi Putra, non Bumi Putra, whatever. No? It comes naturally. It will come naturally. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we are seeing even at the bar, no? the bar used to be seen as you know, a wholly exclusive uh, an enclave. You know, Chinese and the Indians or whatever. Very few Malays. Because it's called the bar, it's not uh, alcoholic. Oh, that's why it's the bar. <laughs> kurang halal, but, kurang but you look at the composition now, it's different. It's different. You look at the composition of the bar council, for instance. Yes. Any uh, Malays uh, in the membership. So things are changing. Uh, but of course, many more things ought to change. Universities. Uh, Top level appointments, uh, but let, let's do it in stages. Yeah. Uh, because you touched on the economics, and, and, and that's why you, even earlier on, you mentioned sometimes we cannot touch on one without the other, the institutional reform and some of the matters in relation to economy. Um, we, we, we see a lot of dynamics going on. And we, 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 we know that from Kelantan, we always complain about the oil royalties. Sabah and Sarawak as well. Because to some extent, when we look at the hard numbers, oh, we are the oil richest states. And yet, when we look at other reports, Sabah, Sarawak, and Kelantan, we are also the poorest. Um, I know it also relates to the Parliamentary Accounts Committee, the Public Accounts Committee, and, and all of it. Because if the development, if the money do not come down properly, that itself uh, will create such tension that, that you mentioned. It, you know, the because it's always related to, oh, Malay are poor. I, I know also, you see, in the past, when we talk about poor or the project is not moving, it's because of access to banking. And I know they are all interrelated because access to banking for the smaller loans, say 5,000, 10,000, this is, I'm quite sure you know, in the corporate side, side. We, we, we refer them as what we call it, the uh, micro, micro, credit. yeah, micro credit. They are all related uh, because the majority that needed the micro credit are Malays. And it's a fact that let's, let's deal with it uh, factually. And therefore, I know I can understand in those days without technology, we can't. Now we have FinTech. Uh, so on and so forth. You, you could see that 
as far as the fintech is concerned, the cost is, remains the same. It's just a number, how many people that the computer has to handle. Um, do, do you feel that now there is at least some solution to that? Mm. Yeah, I know it's slightly yeah. out of our, our law, parliament, but, but they are interrelated. There are no choice. So, you know, it is a question of political will again. NEP is a splendid idea. Yeah. But it floundered uh, for lack of political will or, or fascication. Yeah. So if you talk about economic planning across racial lines, then we have to live up to it. Um, there are poor Malays, just as there are poor Chinese. Correct. Right. Yeah, and very poor Indians and Kadazans and Muruts and Ibans and Orang Ulus and so on. Um, but you see, we live still live in silos. I don't think there are many Indians or Chinese who have been to Guamusang. Coincidence? Yeah. Yeah, it's a fact of life. So or Baling, no, also the certain depressed areas in Kedah where they, you see the Malays were very poor. Yeah. And likewise, I don't think there are that many Malays who have been into the poorest areas uh, of the new villages and, and uh, the inner cities uh, to see how the Chinese poor live. Correct. Uh, or the estates. Um, so we live in our own comfort zone. And we talk in terms of high principles of equality, right? Without really appreciating uh, what poverty is like across the races. I think until and unless we do, I don't think really we are going to achieve anything very much by way of leadership, by, by way of proper planning, and by way of having the proper political will. So it's just going to be empty talk and criticism and so on and so forth. Um, that is why, again, we have to get our leaders elected properly. If not the leaders elected properly, we have to get our opposition members uh, who have the welfare of the people at heart elected. Whoever you, you want, get them in so that they can serve as a check and balance and work through the committee systems. Get it moving. You know, I tried to encourage the formation of all party parliamentary groups, for instance. You can achieve something if you tackle it through you know, an all party parliamentary group um, on poverty. Yeah. Include you know, within this group, uh, in, the group does not need to consist only of MPs. You get all your experts, uh, you get all those people who speak very grandly about you know, why Malaysia should be moving. Become members of the all-party parliamentary group, get down on the ground and think of concrete steps to be taken. Right? That's how it should be done. I, I think this country cannot be left purely to the leaders. <laughs> yes, yeah. correct. We have to do something. That's why I tried to encourage it. And one of the all-party party parliamentary group, which was at the forefront, uh, and it is still there is the all-party parliamentary group on sustainable development. Uh, they have a committed group of civil society members, no, not elites, no, civil society members now who are thinking of actual projects on the ground and working together with the MPs in certain selected constituencies to achieve practical solutions to problems. This is where we should be moving. A government not of grand infrastructure projects, but a government of small things, a government for the small man, irrespective of race. That's how we should be moving. You know? So those who do not want to be part of it, then I suppose what can we do? You know. So we just grumble, 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 you don't yeah. do much about it. Okay, um, talking about this economy, um, World Bank actually, when they comment on Malaysia, touch on one point, 
which is agriculture. Actually, they even make the comment that no country can talk about high income or moving further up unless you get your agriculture policy right. But you could see in Malaysia, agriculture is quite tricky. Now, you know, if you look at agriculture as well, oh, oh, if I had to deal with the land, it's a state down. Okay, now you know it. It could be the opposition, it could be the federal government. Then we have to deal with all the various components, agencies in the MOA, Ministry of Agriculture. Then we have to deal with other federal departments. You know, you, you need to, you need electricity, it's one department. You need water, irrigation is uh, another department, so on and so forth. I know during Tan Sri Muhyiddin's time, he brought in the concept of that senior coordinating minister, because we do realize that we need some coordination among, you know, otherwise we're going to hit. Uh, we've been, people always say that they've been passed, you know, bureaucratic, what, bureaucratic red tapes, they've been passed from one department to another and nothing gets done. And the most important is actually agriculture. Do you think the concept of that senior coordinating minister or any such concept, because we need coordination. I think to some extent you mentioned about that. Mm -hmm. Because that will be something new. You know, in, in addition to the parliamentary select committee, you know, so what do you think of that concept that's that senior coordinating minister? Yeah, but, but to expect something big from one person or several persons in cabinet mm -hmm. uh, may not be the most efficient way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So, but if you have a good person handling it, someone with expertise and vision and uh, welfare of people at heart, uh, I suppose things can be done. It can be said for the entire cabinet too. Yeah. Um, it makes me think, why don't we emulate what Ton Razak did? Ah. <laughs> uh, yes, no, I, I think everybody Raza, eventually you know, referred to Tunraza, yes. Grand development, economic de development as would a general in, in the battle. Yeah. You remember those days? He would be on. Yeah. Yeah, he knew everything. Yeah. You know, it was all there, only you know, the development, whatever books, whatever you call red book, green book, whatever. Ah, so he would do surprise checks. Yeah. Not at the ministerial level, but you would go down to the lowest level. To the district Check. officer level. Yeah. Every and year. Uh, yes. Things got done. <laughs> That's why I think those days, um, a lot of countries wanted to learn from us. Huh? Remember yeah. those days? Yes. So good land development scheme and so on and so forth. Huh? No. Uh, things are different now. No, because I, I believe, because Tun Raza got it right in the sense that he he knew that our district officer actually what when i when you talk about that i realized every year uh, he he would go to every district you know maybe one month one district and he will talk to the district officer and the following year he will go back to the same district officer or the district because he realized that the district officer is actually the government machinery's front liner. You, you can have the guy at the top, okay? I mean, you could have Isma Asabri, Tan Sri Muhyiddin, doesn't matter which Tan Sri, talk about the MCO SOP. But the DO of Bachok knows what is going on there. Precisely. Not the Prime Minister. Precisely. Okay. And the your DO will we'll know which yes. household should be a help. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, correct. So do we now, since we are talking about this, do, do you feel that maybe we, we got to relook at that, that role of that district office? Your comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I fully support. But keep politics out of it. Yes. You know, it's got to be fairly done. And uh, allocations should be made, not based on political affiliations and so on and so forth. Right? And this is the government of small things. Yeah. Uh, the lowest level, the development yes. is more focused, you know? and once it is more focused, 
we can see a lot more economic development and these people don't go hungry mm. cleaner roads you mm. know cleaner streets and no flooding whatever you know? mm. uh, but to expect those in high authority to do things like this i don't think it's going to work particularly they have become so used to power and uh, yeah. lead very you know elaborate yeah, and, uh, lives <laughs> put it blindly um, we should do it that way. And you got a good point also that I want to comment on, on agriculture being such an important component of our economic development. For the life of me, I, I cannot understand why it is not given priority. Why until today we are importing rice okay. or vegetables yeah. Yeah, or many other foodstuff, yeah. right? including yeah. dairy products and fruits. Why do we learn from the Thais and the Indonesians? Don't need to go far, don't need to go to Netherlands or Australia. <laughs> learn from our neighbors. Yeah, you know? Thailand, uh, yes. The Siamese, uh, the Thais are very good at it. And so are the Indonesians. Yeah? You know, I, I'm one of the things I regret because I was booted out, you know, so soon. We were planning a trip to Thailand upon the invitation of the you know, Thai um, Ministry of Agriculture, I think, and parliamentarians. You know? They wanted to showcase to us uh, what they were doing in agricultural development. Uh, I was supposed to be part of this you know, government parliament kind of, uh, tour to study what could be done in, in Malaysia. It never happened again, mm. thanks to Sheraton Move. <laughs> Many things we can learn from our ties. I hope they, they win. I don't know. The government after that was so involved and so preoccupied with maintaining power. I don't know what they did. Yeah. So. It's true. Um, I we were. I was on some of the subcommittees in the Economic Council, uh, and we realized that we are importing around 77 billion worth of food a year. About 50 million are fresh and 27 are processed food, you know, sausages and things mm. like that. So in terms of forex exchange losses, after 10 years, is if you key in the interest and everything, it will be like one trillion. Mm. And that's why it's one of the dampener on our economy. Our money keep flowing out. Okay, and that, I, I thank thank you for highlighting this. Yeah, you know, I, I just want to say something. Right? Something that I sort of discussed with one of the MPs from Kedah. So I said, look, I am growing some vegetables uh, by by way of a hydroponic, you know agriculture oh. in my house. So why, why don't you do it uh, in your constituency? Get a few of the farmers, well, mostly idle, once a paddy is harvested. <laughs> yes. Get them you know, to rare fish. The lapia avances um, can multiply so fast. It's, it, can, it sells very well, though. Yeah? It was expensive prices. Try and get the lapias nowadays uh, in the supermarket. They fetch yeah. a good price yeah. and grow vegetables. Um, Brazilian salad, so many vegetables which can grow like wheat, you know, but you can eat them. <laughs> uh, why don't you do this? Canto, uh, canto. Yeah, I calculate, uh, based on my calculations, if we take 30,000 ringgit yeah, and get a group of them in the kampung, so maybe yeah. five or 10 of them, uh, based on this 30,000 ringgit, and you can get at least uh, the, the the main or the staple vegetables grown without spending too much eh? mm -hmm. and why do you multiply it across the constituency yeah i thought it was a good idea but you know what you said yeah you know but um, those people will not want to work on it right? that, that is also a problem because we among the things that we looked at we realized that there are 100 over 1,000 hectares mm. of, we categorize them as tanah terbiak. 
Mm. It was given to them, they didn't want to work on it. Mm. And yet sometimes we talk about, we worried about foreign workers. Now you can see that sometimes there is a dynamic going on. What's your view of foreign workers? Foreign workers, of course, uh, there is still a demand because our guys don't want to work, don't want to work in the plantation sector. Yeah. No, in the hospitality sector, and you know, all the restaurants or whatever that we have. Uh, we'll close shop, but they can't get foreign workers. Already they're having problems, uh, barbers mm. as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, we have to adjust somewhat. Can't entirely rely on foreign workers. In the plantation sector, there was talk of you know, uh, using machines or uh, robotics to harvest. Yeah. But then again, I think the industry says it's going to be too expensive. Mm. Things like that. So they prefer to rely on imported labor. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's plantation sector. Yeah. Hospitality sector, we, we see that with the COVID and uh, problem. You go to the hotels, you see that many locals are working there now, as opposed to several years before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for time after beer and promoting agriculture, at constituency level, I feel there will there can be an answer to this. Yeah. We have many many unemployed graduates. Correct, exactly. Why can't we use them? Uh, have a system, have a policy whereby all these unemployed graduates can be paid. I don't think many of them will demand too much. If you, they just want a job for most of them, just fresh out of the university, get them involved uh, with the assistance of like your DO and your DON eh, and whoever uh, is in a position of uh, authority and administration at that level, rope them, them in. And why do we do it? Uh, whatever system that we use, hydroponic or whatever, and you know, thermal uh, vegetation, Whatever, so that at least the tanah terbia uh, will be fully utilized. You mentioned in your area. I can think of a kampung. I live in a kampung. There's so yeah. many tanah terbia, correct? Which, if combined, can reap quite uh, a harvest, correct? Yeah? But now what we see? I mean, some some you know use tanah terbia. They go and plant, uh, let's say bananas, for instance, <laughs> completely unregulated. <laughs> and that is good to me. Down to so can be down, down to In Klanta, uh, we have down to uh, Hopefully, the ketum, <laughs> but not ketum. But the banana plant, plants are everywhere. Yeah. Quite clearly, someone is enterprising enough in my kampong to do it, to several of them. So, why can't we do it in a structured way? Get the Ministry of Agriculture involved, get the unemployed graduates involved. Or for that matter, I will talk about unemployed graduates, the doctors. So many uh, you know, unemployed doctors, fresh from medical school, can't even get a placing in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. Maybe one year, nine months, they get a placing. Yeah. Why, why, why do we tolerate such a system? When to me, a simple way to do it would be, you spend some money to employ them. You know, our ratio is not up to the mark. Uh, per population, you need so many doctors, right? Maybe we are still lagging, yeah? So why can't we use these people? No, right. if you can't find places in the hospitals, why do you use them in the local clinics, whatever? Pay right. them something rather than allow them to hibernate at home and lose that precious medical knowledge. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Why we cannot think of ways to overcome these problems. Okay? I think, pardon me for saying so, mm. Our politicians are too engrossed in power. Yeah. With the politics. That's the brutal truth. I think, I mean, prove me wrong, whatever. Yeah. I think they're too engrossed in power. And not, not looking at solving a problem, solutions. Both, you know, I'm saying this for, for uh, both levels. Yeah. Uh, government both. as well as opposition. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Recently, you know, I'm 
relating to bail now. Uh, Basika uh, lanjak. <laughs> mm. Okay, we you know that that lady Sam Keting, she could not get her bail immediately. Mm. Uh, you know, at the ground roots level, people were saying, "Well, Najib is appealing to the federal court. He he could get bail, mm. even okay. though High Court and Court of Appeal has." Uh, have upheld the the decision, and you 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 have been the you know a retired court of appeal judge, okay, and 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 Nikki Liao, you know the the guy who was charged with twenty six counts of money laundering recently, you know after one year of hiding he surrendered, and he got a bail of one million, so many people are asking. Are, are these special VIPs? And one of these poor clerk could not get her bill. Are, are you able to comment on that? I mean, yeah, judge. <laughs> because mm. you know, I'm quite sure you receive a lot of Pasika Lanja WhatsApps. Mm. Please, thanks. You know, we are very close to trending on uh, subjudice. Huh? Uh, yeah. uh, it doesn't matter still before the courts. Yes. And uh, from what I read today, or was it yesterday evening, um, Court of Appeal will be hearing the application on Monday. I think so. Eh? Yeah. Um, which is very fast, as it yeah. should be. Uh, yeah. But without commenting on the merits of, of the case, uh, yeah. I think I can say in cases like this, surely the person deserves to be granted bail. Surely. Yeah, that, this can prove me thought. wrong. Can I yeah. let any lawyer prove me wrong? Yeah. I don't think there is anything in the law to say that if you need leave to appeal, you can't you can't be granted bail before you file the application for leave to appeal. Yeah. You know, even if there is such a, a law or, or practice, in cases like this, you can hear it almost immediately. Mm -hmm. Or at least within the week, right? I mean, they're doing it hopefully, yeah? hopefully, yeah. But we read it's true because routinely cases like this, especially under RTO, the road traffic on yeah, the offense, correct. routinely comes yeah. up. It's not, yeah, it's not a murder case. No? <laughs> application for leave, and, and then uh, if we look at it, when I was a judge, uh, I, was, yeah. I said, That's why I asked you, uh, you were when judge. we look at it, okay, you know, we have a divergence of opinion. Uh, Magistrate's court decided to, uh, to, to convict. Yeah. I court decided to acquit. All right. Okay, let's go and leave because quite clearly it, we yes. don't have something very concrete. That's how right. we used to do it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like here. Yeah. Two times they said she she, <laughs> she has no there's no case against her. Yeah? Yeah. And then after hearing uh, the yeah. defense case, uh, they said no case as well. Mm. Yeah? Not proven beyond reasonable doubt. And now you have the high court saying, yeah, proven beyond reasonable doubt. So on this basis, this sh she should be allowed leave to appeal, yeah. okay. whether she succeeds later on, on the merits. Yeah. Let, let's look at it. Yeah. You know, um, I I wouldn't like to comment on that because I've not seen the judgment or the grounds of decision of the yeah. magistrate's court. Although I have seen grounds of uh, decision of the high court. Yeah. Yeah. But the, um, the magistrates actually acquitted her twice. <laughs> Once um, at the conclusion of the prosecution case, and then went to the high court, high court kicked it back, and she reheard it, and then decided at the end of the defense case, yeah, uh, it was not proven beyond reasonable doubt. Yeah. So, if it's beef, uh, I hope the court of appeal will grant a leave to appeal. Um, so, to, uh, Sometimes I think, and this is not venturing the subject, so <laughs> sometimes I think a little bit of common sense in the law is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's okay. put it that way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tanshree. Thank you. Okay. I think we have more or less uh, come to all my questions. <laughs> 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 but uh, how about the, our, our guest here? in this uh, uh, chat room, 
Do, do you all have any questions? Can you please type in? Maybe we can take questions from the floor. Yeah. At the, or nobody. <laughs> nobody. <then. laughs> I must have bought everyone to, to no end. <laughs> Can I ask something, Tanshri? Uh, yeah. uh, there was someone who asked why you have rejected TM's request to convene parliament for a no confidence vote on MY. Tanshri Muidin. Muidin. Tanshri Muidin. I did not reject, you know, I, I accepted the motion. But then again, according to the procedure, um, it cannot be given priority unless the government, the minister in charge, moves it up. And this is the flaw in the system. The speaker cannot do it. Although, quite frankly, I can tell you now, I was thinking of some member of parliament you know, being smarter and saying, okay, let's put it to the vote of the house. No one did. No? But it happened in Perak. Ah, yes. In Perak, there was a smart uh, Dun member right. who put uh, in a motion. <laughs> I think it was a DAP motion. Right? <laughs> yeah. And then they voted on it. All right, to you know, prioritize the motion of no confidence. Or in that case, a motion of confidence. They did the first one on the Menteri Besar. Yeah. So the motion of confidence was prioritized, voted on, and then it became a motion of no confidence. That led to a change of uh, the MB in Terra. Many things can be done, but don't expect the speaker to have the white power. He does not have white power. Yeah. But whenever you have a lacuna like this, leave it to the floor of the house. But best of all, uh, I think this is another urgent need for reform. You got a man, the standing orders, um, to ensure that if you have a motion of confidence or no confidence, it, it push must it be heard. Time must be accorded to it. This is a, a Australian and UK system. Uh, we don't have it as yet. So again, part of the package of reforms which we must have on top of uh, you know the anti hopping it's not the only thing that we must have yeah somebody has also asked uh Stephen, if you look at it at the chat group somebody have asked let me get out uh, somebody says when thanks we didn't became prime minister he changed the date of the first date of parliament in 2020 my reading of the standing order is that the PM or leader of the house cannot change the date of the first sitting. That is a date summoned by the YDPA. Why did you allow the change of date? No, again, this is a uh, standing order thing. Uh, the dates of parliament uh, are not chosen by the speaker. It is the house or rather the leader of the house who chooses it. Uh, because quite clearly, I mean, in terms of legislative uh, uh, schedule, um, the government will be in the best position to know what bills are coming up, how many days are needed. Right? Yeah. As speaker, I didn't have any knowledge on what's coming and when really we should sit. But of course, uh, there would be discussion between the cabinet and uh, the still sir they want on what dates will be appropriate. That's how it's decided, you know, on a, in a cooperative way. But we do not have the final say, nor should it be. Okay. Um, but again, this has to be another topic of reform. Uh, you cannot have the prime minister as the leader of the house. There must be someone else who yeah. should be the leader of the house. Otherwise, yeah. the prime minister becomes too powerful. Yeah. And the leader of the house should really also then discuss with the leader of the opposition okay, in a collegial way to decide on the legislative agenda. Okay. That's how else. sorry we should operate really in terms of maturity in parliament. Right. And someone else 
someone is asking, what is your view on the possible upcoming of the Parliamentary Services Act in the July sitting? And do you think, in your opinion, that Parliament will be more independent? Or is PSA being used as a smokescreen to project that Parliament is independent? Uh, you're talking about the anti-hopping legislation, constitutional amendment, I mean. I guess so. Uh, all right. So back to what I was discussing earlier with Stephen. Um, yeah, so the special select committee, yeah. Um, really, I don't think they should spend so much, too much time on it. Uh, um, it can be very easily done. All this talk about having the constitutional amendment dependent on ordinary law, seeing it the right way. I think the main amendments must be constitutional amendments. Article 48 of the Constitution must be amended to make it very clear. Whoever party hops, he loses his eligibility. The workings of when to call for by election or that can be done by ordinary law. So you must have it. But you cannot have ordinary law to specify the grounds of disqualification. You're asking for trouble. <laughs> so it, it will not be conclusive of the problem. You get it challenged later on in some court of law and you don't have a proper forum, they might just overturn it. Right? Which was what happened in the celebrated or notorious Dordian Saleh case. <laughs> uh, the judges actually used a dissenting judgment of the Indian Supreme Court to come to their decision. Very simply, you know, one of the senior judges say, oh, that's India, you know, they have this problem in Malaysia, we don't have this problem. I mean, what foresight or lack of foresight is that? Now, of course, we have this problem. Yeah. yeah of course, we have this problem. And, you know, to say that we don't have this problem, it's not correct. That's why even judges have to be astute to political conditions. We had this problem way back in 1961. In Terengganu, okay? when five uh, members of the DUN, uh, three from Parti Rakyat and two from PAS, cross over to Perikatan, and the PAS government was defeated. The 61. We have good record, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And after that, of course, we had uh, Piasco in Sarawak. Uh, and then several in Sabah, uh, which is the country holding, you know, the state holding the record in terms of yeah, party hopping. But everyone was quite relaxed about the United States. Para, for instance, yeah, until the ceiling hit the uh, whatever hit the roof, and then the entire federal government fell after the Sheraton government moved. So now that we know what the problem is, <laughs> I think there's no pussy footing. They must have it done in June. Don't tell us that uh, you know, it's so difficult, you know, a, a problem. It is simple. In fact, I simple. give uh, what I presented at the webinar to some of the MPs. And one of them used the argument that I posed. He said, we must amend Article 48 directly, include the main provisions there. We don't even need to amend Article 10 1, according to him. I think we seem to amend Article 10 1. Um, so it can be done. If yeah. they are serious about it, just sit down over the weekend and draft it right on track. <laughs> but don't give us something so wishy washy as the current draft. I think it's not something which even a final year student in the law faculty will draft. It's just a real so problem. It's it's it makes no sense, you know. So I don't know. It's, a, it's a very disheartening to see the so-called legal experts coming up with the, such you know, dismal drafting. It could be done better, and I hope they do. Anyway, I who am I? I'm an outsider. I can say all those things. Okay, then there's another question from uh, Chan. 
Yep. Is there a parliamentary law stating that unvaccinated citizens are not allowed to enter shopping malls and public enclosed places? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's all done under that act, you know. We're giving awesome powers. Oh. So if they don't like it, go and challenge it in court, like, as the Americans have done. I don't think even in America, they've had much <laughs> success. <laughs> this is public health concerns. Yeah. There's no infringement of uh, freedom of movement or liberty of the person. If you, if you don't want to be vaccinated, fine. <laughs> don't be vaccinated. But there are consequences. You know? So, like a friend of mine refused to be vaccinated for reasons that I cannot understand. And suddenly he finds out that without being vaccinated, he can't even attend prayers at the masjid. Yeah. Uh, or go for his umrah. So promptly he got himself vaccinated. Nothing happened to him. <laughs> no withdrawal symptoms or whatnot. So people read all this nonsense that are viral. There's one question, Tansri, from James Joshua. To me, as an ex Malaysian lawyer, there are three major offices of state under the Malaysian constitution one, the office of the prime minister, two, the office of the speaker, and three, the function of the AG. When all three are properly and constitutionally performed, the country can function according to the design of a Westminster system. Oh, what is Correct. this? You're right. I mean, yeah. I only agree. Yeah. But there's also another element to it. Yeah? The constitutional monarch. Yeah. You must include that into. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's very, very true. AG is also is very important. Yeah? I think AG is more important even than speaker. Speaker is only a master of his, his own house, huh? yeah? in terms of decorum and proceedings of the house. Actually, he's got very little power yeah? for the moment. But the AG has got awesome powers, and everyone listens to the AG, seemingly. Yeah? Or the AG's legal advice, yeah? AG's position. Yeah? I want to say the, 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 the uh, hold of, of the view that uh, even if it's the AG's position, it need not necessarily be right. <laughs> I think it's also in the book. Yeah? They wanted me to affirm an affidavit for the Prime Minister. I said, no, I won't do it because uh, I'm not uh, an appendage of, of uh, the executive as speaker. I can swear and affirm an affidavit on my behalf, but I can't do it for the for the prime minister or in the prime minister's name. That's not right. Yeah? Um, of course, I we'll see that's probably not friendly and not you know pro executive now whatever. And even the secretary eventually was persuaded to affirm an affidavit for the prime minister, despite my advice. And that's another story. A uh, good story to include in the book, which I've included. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I have uh, one, one question. Uh, in fact, this uh, regarding the recent usul uh, by the government on SOSMA, which is uh, uh, to what to uh, for the detention under detention sub, without trial. Uh, yeah. four to five, yeah, and then and it, it was defeated by the uh, uh I think 86, 87, yeah, mm. the government was sold being defeated. So I think probably this is the first time in the history of parliament where the government was sold being defeated. Mm. So I just wonder, uh, uh, of course, we know there's a split in the, in the government of the day, yeah, but uh, because being, well, I'm a, being an ex uh, uh, policeman, yeah, we, because that 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 succession is very important, yeah, very important for all of us, yeah, uh, because we don't have ISA, so that session of detention up to twenty eight days, yeah, for syndicated crime and also for uh, let's say uh, 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 for other other subversive uh, elements, yeah. Because like like the, the attack by the Philippines uh, to Sabah, we use SOSMA. 
just I wonder if we don't use SOSMA, we can detain them for that 28 days. You know, I mean, uh, this, I just wonder uh, uh, whether, okay, the question is whether that usul, yeah, can be, can be brought again to the parliament uh, within this session. Mm. Uh, there are several you know, strands to this uh, issue. Right? I think on issues like this, that there should be discussion, you know, prior interaction between the government and the opposition, as any mature parliament would. Yeah. Didn't happen here. Right? Yeah. Um, of course, the opposition have always taken the, the, the stand that they didn't want this provision. Right? They hold the view that whatever is there constitutionally and in the penal criminal procedure code should give sufficient protection. Uh, you arrest a person and then bring him to the magistrate, ask for a remand or extended remand, by which time you should be able to uh, formalize the charge. I mean, that, that's their view, you know, in terms of protecting fundamental rights, because basically there are also abuses in the past uh, on this. But like most things, if done properly, if handled properly, there could be an adjustment, an improvement, and an appreciation of each other's position. That was not done. Now, what do we have now? A defeat by just one vote? Or you, you, it was two votes. But then someone said, no, you wrongly counted it. Well, such things only happen in Malaysia. You know? Malaysian <laughs> Uh, but it was two votes or one vote still. Yeah. Uh, technically, technically, because it involves a motion and not a constitutional amendment, that motion can be reintroduced in the next session. You don't need to wait for one uh, Penggal. Penggal, yeah, uh, one term, which means a year to reintroduce the motion. But uh, of course, if you look at it from the point of view of principle involved, it is just like an amendment. So you should wait for one year before you, in, you reintroduce it. Anyway, this is a moot point. This is a moot point. Um, but technically, if you ask me, technically, because it is a motion, it can be reintroduced. Yeah. Um, unlike uh, a private member's motion, that's different eh? because this is a government motion. Government motion, uh, government motion it's, it's still there, it's top of the line. Uh, but uh, private member's motion, you have to refile and then you lose, you lose your priority. You're not sure whether you're going to get it again. Of course, most times you don't get it again. anyway. So, um, but, but technically, that, that's how it, it is. So. Okay. okay, thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, do you have anything now? Uh, I think Oliver is Oliver there because he, he, he typed in a message, would like to ask on the agriculture. Is Oliver still there? He asked to be unmute. Oliver Ho. I saw he sent a message. Is he still there? Or he's yeah, no more already, there? We have already covered agriculture, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, if, if there are no more, okay, then the, thank you. Yes, there's uh, one more uh, okay. from uh, Dr. Oliver. Uh, he yes. has some comment on the usage of the land. I'll um, admit him, uh, allow him to ask the question, yeah? Okay, thanks. Dr. Okay. Uh, yes, good afternoon. It's a very good speech. I'm also a member of BGAM. And uh, thanks to Stephen and uh, Dolly. And uh, <coughs> Gary allowed me to speak. Now, Stephen, you say there are about 100,000 of hectares of unused agricultural land. Okay, with due respect, I've talked to many uh, non bumi farmers who are willing to expand their agriculture uh, uh, local production 
but limited to land use because most of them are belongs to the Bumi. With due respect, huh? okay, why don't the government be smart enough to save trillions of dollars by investing this? If you're 100,000, you give uh, five hectares to one Bumi, if there were 20,000 Bumi will get it. And of the 20,000, the government financed a quarter million, but 2.5 billion, and joint venture in a shared prosperity vehicle with the Chinese and Indian. 50-50, no one have a majority, not the 70-30 of those uh, 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 free forwarders, 50-50. Everybody say bought two Bumi, two Ch Chinese or two Bumi, one Indian, one Chinese, still on board, and governed by a special vehicle in the government, but people like us can be down there to oversee the country, that these people put the money to use, I can assure you, within 10 years, all your unemployed graduates will go to there. Why? Because they are Kusahawan. They are not employed in a farm working for $1,500 a bungalow. Mm -hmm. And this will, we can help in this respect. But I don't see why the government, you should not use Kutok, okay, you talk one thing and go to Ministry of Agriculture, then go to the state, no. Just make one like Tun Raza in Felda. Remember Felda 40 years ago when it started, there were about 20 over percent, 25 percent non Bumi in the states. Those days, lah, I remember my father told me. So now you do this critical, share prosperity critical. The Malays and the North will be joined together and share the economy well. You see, not only the impact of agriculture will cause saving in the economy, but in after 10 years to one generation, it will be racial harmony. Great idea. You know. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I'm all for it. You know, but, uh... <laughs> I'm an ex-banker. <laughs> oh, ex-banker. Oh, you're not an agricultural banker. <laughs> then you would be able oh, to work out the terms. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Nasri. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. To, to some extent, uh, a senior retired civil servant actually said that uh, those who entered agriculture, uh, they are actually earning quite well. Yeah. Um, I actually asked my coconut seller. You know, the guy's on the parking park himself in that food truck selling coconut. I said, uh, Uncle, Uncle, how much do you earn a month? He actually said, Uncle, don't study much. We just sell coconut. That's the only thing I'm good at. He earns 10,000 a month. He's above B40 already. <laughs> way, way above people. So, I think it's important for our economy, in, in all honesty. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps uh, because we have Tan Sri Dr. Saleh in the house, a uh, uh, good friend of BGAN, uh, maybe Tan Sri Dr. Saleh would like to comment also if you'd like to. Uh, you can unmute yourself, Dr. Tan Sri Dr. Saleh. Uh, to share, uh, you know, uh, being a founder of a, a free forest research institute yeah. of Malaysia. Yeah, we wow. are honored to have him uh, in the house. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks, Lee. Uh, you? Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum. Uh, congratulations, uh, OP Tansri. Are you? OP, yeah. OP stands for <laughs> old, old Putra. Yeah, the ah, yeah, RMC, 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 very old Putra. RM, RMC group, yes. Um, congratulations on your talk. Uh, very interesting. Unfortunately, I'm not in politics, but um, <laughs> I wish I, I wish I had actually. Looking back in my life, I was offered to join politics in 1960s, but then I opted to be a forester and the orang hutan, and then I remained. Um, the question raised that, that interested me was this 100,000 hectares of, of underutilized land. Actually, there's about 4 million hectares of underutilized land. Wow. That's much, much more than 100,000. Yeah, so there's a lot that can be done. Uh, and um, one of the reasons uh, in Negus Milan is Adat Bapake. When uh, mm. mm. the maternal heritage goes to the to the to the women, and the men do not want to work on the land because it doesn't belong to them, and so in the next Milan you find lots and lots of underutilized land. But this is well, is the whole nation, and as a forester, I've gone through all these areas and seen for the, my for my own my own eyes. In the amount of underutilized land. I think government should address this issue 
the other issue is dairy farming. We import but uh, I think about two billion dollars worth of uh, dairy products. Uh, I think the figure quoted is higher. Um, uh, Fifty billion. Lot. Yeah, seventy-seven billion food. Yeah, a lot. There's there's no reason why we should not we could not do that. Uh, we cannot address this issue. So you're right, Santi. Agriculture needs a, a totally a new perspective, a new uh, review on how we look at agriculture as a whole. Uh, I, I would suggest that Parliament has set up a parliamentary agriculture a special committee to look at just agriculture and mm. bring the experts to discuss this. One of the problems, of course, is land is the state jurisdiction, but the states are just as concerned about land. Now, the other issue is fish. I mean, I'm working on an aquaponics project now, uh, and uh, where we can grow fish, not just tilapia, I can say much higher quality fish, and grow vegetables at the same time. Yeah. And each, each system for the for the household, for the kampong, um, does not need to exceed uh, 20,000 ringgit. The government can, can invest into all these things. And I'd be happy to share my experience with this. We are developing a fairly large aquaponics project in Manong, in Pera, uh, which should be launched around the end of this month or early next month. Now, that will produce fish and vegetables at the same time. And aquaponics has a huge potential to my mind in addressing the food shortage. Thank you very much, Tansi. Congratulations. Selamat raya. Selamat raya, you Tansri, maybe uh, I should mention your, your name to the all um, what the APPGM or Party <laughs> Parliamentary Group on Sustainable Development. Uh, one yes. of the things seriously on this, you know. Uh, no, I would be happy to contribute in any way possible. You know, yeah. I'm, a, I'm willing to share my knowledge, whatever I have. And um, the other issue is, of course, forest. I mean, is there any possibility? can see that the federal government take over the rights of a forest from the state. <laughs> and this, oh. is of course, this is, of course, a very <laughs> sensitive issue. But, but no, seriously, you have all the land for development, but the, the, the permanent forest of state, per se, should be managed by the federal government on a sustainable basis. There is a national there's national land land council, national forestry council, but they're just uh, lame duck, as far as I'm concerned. They have no impact on on land use, as you know. The, the state governments pull that very close to the heart, but even to have any any logical um, sustainable land use planning in this country the responsibility jurisdiction of land must be taken over from by uh, by the federal government from the states and there's some the mechanisms are doing this okay? without them losing the benefit from the forest and now one issue which has become very uh, timely is carbon credits uh, the forest can be sold for carbon sequestration and in the future, I see the potential for biodiversity credits. Without, in other words, without logging a tree, you can get money from the forest. But the federal government must take the lead in doing all this in, uh, so that it benefits the states without harvesting the forest. And finally, one of the biggest problems we're going to have in the future is water. Water is gold. Uh, we are we're seeing it now uh, not just water for domestic use water for irrigation but look at all these floods yeah. so we have to address the environment in a holistic way and land use is primary to all these issues can see thank you Stephen. and i thank see you, a number that's of friends thank there. You, that's <laughs> yeah we are already past our <laughs> <laughs> it has been an interesting talk. Do you have anything more to say, Tan Sri Ari or Mr. Stephen Fang? I, I, I have no more. I think I have asked yeah. too many questions. <laughs> I, 
I, I wish to offer my thanks to everyone. And it's been just as interesting for me to answer your difficult questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think you all, we all have to think through with problems together. Yeah, I think it's a good sign. Okay. So it has been a, a very interesting discussion today. Thank you everyone for lending your ears. But let us have a little caveat because we are discussing on certain things which are a little bit uh, nosy. So DGM is merely uh, a, a social platform and we are not in politics. So we are not very interested to dwell into matters other than what we discuss in this small group. And also in the course of our in, in the course of us organizing this event, we could have some errors and omissions, except or in or maybe some uh, incompetences arising. We hope it's all uh, we, we, we hope we beg your pardon in such situation. And with this, we would like to thank Sri Ari for having spent most of your morning with us, given giving us a better picture of the working politics of the day and the future, and also advise us on some worrying issues on food. Lots of thanks to Inchet Lufti, who have helped us coordinate with Tan Sri to make this event a success. Yeah. Thank our moderator, Mr. Stephen Fang, our organizing committee comprising of Mr. Rashte, Juan Masna, our administrative staff, who have been actively involved in running the Zoom system, Mr. Fu Jongwi, our membership chairman, the busy marketing the event. Mr. Mm -hmm. Mr. our secretary, the general coordinate, generally coordinating the event with the whole expo, and others have lent a helping hand in making the event successful. Last but not least, our chairman, who worked half of the day. Uh -huh. He has sleepless night until last night was still texting me. Thank you very much, everyone, for lending your ears. It was a very interesting talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very Thank you. much. Bye, everyone. Yeah. And, and don't forget to buy Tan Sri's book, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Man, unexpected. Buy the hard copy. Buy the hard copy. Hard copy. Hard cover. What are you? You can buy through BGAM. <laughs> okay, everyone. Um, thank, you. Okay. thank you. Thank you very much, Hansi. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Well done, Dolly. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dolly. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, President. <laughs> <laughs>